Welcome back everybody. If there's one company that investors will not touch with a 10 foot pole right now, that company is Boeing. Boeing was once a blue chip company with strong cash flow that provided investors with a stable dividend payout, but after several key missteps from management over the past few years, such as some alarming quality control issues and a union strike that is currently impacting about 20% of their workforce and costing them $150 million per day, they have now garnered a reputation as perhaps the worst managed company in the US market. Boeing stock is down roughly 40% year to date and is down about 60% from its all-time high back in early 2019. Now, despite these obvious failures from Boeing, which we're going to get into in this video, there's no doubt that Boeing is still a very important company for the US economy. They are still a global leader in the commercial aviation space, holding a 40% market share, and this market is essentially a duopoly with Airbus. And as of Q2, they have a backlog of 5,400 airplanes valued at roughly $437 billion. These are planes that will need to get built and is essentially future revenue that Boeing is under contract to earn. And given how the most amount of airplanes they've delivered in a year was 800 back in the year 2018, this means they still have at least the next seven years of orders in the pipeline, most likely more, and there's going to be more orders coming in after this. So there's no question about the demand for their products. It's more so about how long will it take them to deliver these planes and how profitably can they do it. And they're also a major defense contractor for the U.S. government. Their defense segment is currently earning about $25 billion in revenue per year. And so because of this, many consider Boeing to be in the too big to fail category of companies. So in this video, I want to go over what exactly has been going wrong for Boeing. So what are the actual root causes of these issues? And then how a recovery for Boeing is likely to play out over the next three to five years. So let's quickly talk about Boeing's business before we dive into the recent issues that they've had. So Boeing has three key segments. There is commercial airplanes, defense space and security, and the global services segment. And these three segments are roughly equal in terms of revenue as of the most recent quarter, but historically the airplane segment has been the largest, where back in 2018, it was doing close to $60 billion in annual revenue. But this segment is also much more volatile, with the other two segments having been relatively stable over the past decade. So Boeing does compete with Airbus, but the orders that these companies receive are put in a backlog that can span for over a decade. And as of 2023, Boeing has 5,400 airplanes in their backlog, whereas Airbus has over 8,000 airplanes. And ever since the pandemic, Airbus has taken the lead over Boeing by delivering more aircrafts each year. But despite this, Airbus actually has very limited ability to further capitalize on Boeing's recent failures because they're already operating at max capacity and facing supply chain issues of their own. So even though Boeing has fallen behind, they still have the orders necessary to get this segment back to profitability, and there's going to be enough travel demand for the foreseeable future to ensure that it stays that way. Now, the defense segment's primary customer is the U.S. Department of Defense, with NASA also being a key customer. And some of the more notable products that they have in this portfolio are the KC-46 Pegasus, which is used by the U.S. Air Force. And this product in particular has been experiencing very large cost overruns, which are an issue because the contracts that they have in place for this product have fixed prices. So any cost overruns that Boeing experiences, they just have to absorb themselves. And I think this highlights the importance of cost management for Boeing as a whole, because like I said at the beginning of this video, there's no questions about Boeing's ability to earn revenue, but can they actually fulfill their contract obligations in a profitable manner? That is another story. There's also the P-8 Poseidon, which is used by the U.S. Navy, and the Apache helicopter, which is used by the U.S. Army. And as we can see, the defense segment has historically been very stable, typically generating about $25 billion of revenue per year. And the global services segment is mainly ongoing support that they provide to their airline and defense customers. So everything from things like maintenance, upgrades, modifications, and even things like supply chain and data analytics services. So the growth in the global services segment is highly dependent on growth in their other two segments. And as we can see, this segment has grown somewhat stably over the past decade. So going back to 2018, Boeing was objectively a high quality company. They had return on invested capital that was near 30% at one point. 
and they were consistently profitable with their net income even reaching $10 billion back in 2018. But since then, they've never had a fully profitable year. They have had a few quarters in 2022 and 2023 where they had positive free cash flow, but really they've been a money losing company for a long time now. It all started with the 737 MAX crisis back in 2019, where Boeing 737 MAX aircrafts, which is their most popular model, were grounded due to two fatal crashes that occurred, which tragically took the lives of over 300 people. The crashes happened due to a faulty piece of flight control software that relied on sensor readings to control the nose of the airplane. So aviation regulators across the globe ordered all 737 planes to be grounded until Boeing could fix this software flaw and then undergo rigorous safety checks. And that took them about 20 months before the FAA specifically recertified the 737, allowing it to operate again. Boeing estimated that this whole debacle cost them roughly $20 billion. They had to pay billions of dollars to airlines, including a $400 million payout to Southwest, and they halted the production of the 737 and incurred massive costs from lawsuits and government fines. So as a result, Boeing revenue fell from $101 billion in 2018 to just $58 billion in 2020, and profit fell from $10 billion in 2018 to a loss of $11 billion in 2020. Now, part of this decline was also due to the pandemic. Obviously, the pandemic significantly reduced the demand for travel, which then flowed through into the demand for airplanes. But this only lasted for about one or two years, and eventually air travel demand returned once the borders across the globe were opened up. But when it did return, Boeing started facing supply chain issues specifically for parts like engines and semiconductors. So this made it difficult for Boeing to work through its backlog and they couldn't produce enough planes to reach profitability again. So even despite the recovery in demand, they still reported a $5 billion loss in the year 2022. And something else that's been a hot topic at Boeing for a while now has been their quality control issues. The most newsworthy example was when the door of an Alaskan Airlines flight blew off in the middle of the flight back in January of this year. Now, to be honest, I think this whole incident was really the culmination of a trend that's been occurring at Boeing really for the past 20 years. And honestly, not just Boeing, but also the American manufacturing industry as a whole, which is that these are public companies, right? They are designed to maximize profits, which means cutting costs. So if Boeing has to start doing things like outsourcing how certain parts are made in order to cut costs and increase profitability, then that's obviously what they're going to do. So then what you start to see is things like quality control at Boeing really start to suffer. And until the regulators decide to step in, then that's going to keep being the case. And in an industry like aerospace, where safety is such a massive concern, it's a tall task for safety regulations to keep up with the natural forces of capitalism. And I think this is why when you look at Airbus, for example, and who their largest shareholders are, three of the four largest shareholders are governments. You have Germany, France, and Spain, versus Boeing is solely owned by institutional investors, which naturally pressures the company to keep increasing profit, which for Boeing means cutting costs, outsourcing, and sacrificing quality. Now, a more indirect cost that these losses had on Boeing was how they chose to cover these losses. Obviously, the company was burning through their cash pile, so they had to raise money in order to maintain liquidity. So they decided to do that through issuing massive amounts of debt. From 2018 to 2020, their debt balance ballooned from $13 billion to over $60 billion which at the time, this was a smart choice because interest rates were extremely low and their defense and global services segments were still going strong and generating positive operating income. So Boeing had every reason to believe that this slump would be temporary and they could eventually pay this down. And because their stock price had fallen so much from $400 per share down to below $100 per share, issuing equity would have caused a lot of dilution. But as we can see, they've struggled to pay down this debt because they haven't been generating positive cash flow to use to pay it down, which has also caused their interest coverage ratio to tank from a point where they could easily afford their interest payments to now where the interest is just furthering their losses. So now there's some discussions about Boeing's credit being downgraded by the ratings agencies, which is a big deal because Boeing has historically been a investment grade company. And if this changes, then the interest rates on their debt will increase 
which makes a recovery even more difficult. So this brings us to the present day, where the current problem they're facing is a labor strike that impacts 21% of their workforce, specifically their workers at their Washington facility, which is where their 737 MAX jets are manufactured, which is by far their biggest moneymaker. They do also have 787 jets, which are made in their South Carolina facility, which is not unionized, but they don't produce as many of those jets compared to the 737. For example, in Q2, Boeing delivered 70 737 jets, but only 9 787s. So it seems that the union is in a very strong position here. So far, Boeing has increased their offer to the workers, offering them 30% wage increases, a $6,000 signing bonus, and increased 401k matching. But this offer was rejected because ultimately what the union wants is a 40% pay increase and the restoration of a defined benefit pension plan, which the company got rid of about 10 years ago. And this pension plan is really what's causing the issues in the negotiations. A defined benefit pension plan offers employees with guaranteed lifetime income upon retirement. So they are much more costly for companies to administer than say a defined contribution pension plan where the employer just matches the employee's contributions into some sort of retirement account like a 401k for example. And defined benefit pension plans have largely been eliminated over the past few decades for a number of reasons. Obviously the desire for companies to cut costs is one of them, but also because people began living longer, which made the pension liabilities increase quite a lot. And once the accounting standards were changed to force companies to recognize this liability on their balance sheet, companies that had these started to look like they were in a lot of debt. Even for Boeing specifically, since they eliminated this, they've decreased their pension liabilities from $26 billion in 2016 to only $8 billion currently. So yes, the strike may be costing them hundreds of millions of dollars per day, but giving back these benefits would cost them tens of billions of dollars in the long run. So you can understand why they're hesitant to do that. So as of now, it's unclear how long this strike is going to go on for. And personally, I do find it hard to believe that the workers are going to get everything they're asking for, but it does seem like they do have a lot of leverage right now, just given how much money Boeing is losing every day. So let's now talk about what a recovery for Boeing would look like. Now, the way I see it, there's really four key things that need to happen for Boeing to get back to being the company it once was five years ago. Obviously, the first thing they have to do is resolve this strike that is going on right now. And I would expect that this strike is going to get resolved at some point in the next couple weeks. And what you're going to likely see after the strike is their costs go up because they're going to have to start paying their workers, 20% of their workers that are in this union that is currently striking, they're going to have to start paying them anywhere from 30 to 40% more. So their profit margins going forward are probably going to be lower because of this. The next thing they need to do is they need to ramp up production of their 737 planes. Back in 2018, they were producing 56 of these planes per month, and they're still far away from reaching that level again. Now, it's important to note that Boeing does have a production cap on their 737 planes right now at 38 per month due to the quality control issues that have been noted in the past, but this will presumably be lifted at some point in the future once they can satisfy the FAA safety demands. Then they need to ensure that there's no more surprise quality issues issues going forward, which presumably happened because of their decisions in the past to outsource certain key supplies. So if that means bringing some manufacturing back in-house that was previously outsourced, then so be it, because saving a couple bucks isn't exactly worth having your production capped or having your planes grounded for several months. Then once all that is done and the company is back to profitability, start paying down some of that debt to ensure that there's no credit downgrade and interest costs can be reduced going forward. So let's quickly run the numbers on Boeing to see what a recovery could look like. Let's say by the year 2030, Boeing can resolve all these issues that they're currently facing and get back to producing 800 planes per year at $70 million per plane, which would mean their airplane segment generates $56 billion in revenue. Then if we assume $25 billion in revenue in their defense segment and say $22 billion for their global services segment, that's roughly $100 billion in revenue. So equal to what they did in 2018. Now in 2018, they had a net profit margin of 10.3%. And I don't think it makes sense to assume that they'll achieve this margin again for many reasons like the higher interest expenses, higher wages because of the new union agreement and those supply chain issues that still exist and may force them to outsource less. 
So let's assume their net profit margin in the year 2030 is just 6%, right? So that gives them about $6 billion in net income. Then if we apply a 20x PE to that, which is typically where they traded before, then we'd get a share price of around $194 per share, which versus their current price only gives us about 4.9% annualized return over a five-year holding period. Now, some people watching may think that this is too pessimistic for Boeing, and maybe there is a world that exists where Boeing can actually be a decent investment at its current price. But you also have to consider that management has been making a series of bad decisions for several years now. So, of course, it's possible, but investors have no confidence that this will actually happen anytime soon because of the management that is currently in place. They did recently announce a new CEO, someone with a engineering background, so maybe this provides some relief because it's a change in management, but given how they've already handled this strike situation so far, investors don't have much to be hopeful for. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you did find this video insightful. If you did, then please leave a like, and if you're new to my channel, I'd appreciate it if you would consider subscribing, and I'll see you guys in the next video.